At this very moment, you are joining in with some 4,000 people from six continents and millions more on social media. As the world prepares to build back better from biodiversity loss, food insecurity, climate change, and health pandemics, it's important now more than ever to come together and connect. Now we're excited to start our opening plenary, One World, One Health, setting the scene and the mood. And to kick us off, we have Mayor Ashok Sridharan, Mayor of Bonn City, providing us a welcome message. Dear Global Landscapes community, never has the importance of health for global sustainable development become more evident than during this pandemic. Our challenge in recovery and redesign is to mainstream health in every strategy we plan, in every action we take. Luckily, this challenge is taken up by the UN, by nations, regions and cities, by businesses and citizens alike. Bonn has profiled as a UN and international sustainability hub with a particular spirit of cooperation as well as a nourishing ground for synergies. The Global Landscapes Forum is a valuable partner to many Bonn-based key players, starting with UN Bonn and also including ECLE, Local Governments for Sustainability. As we cannot get together in person, our city is assuming a new role as a central digital knowledge and news platform. Leaders and experts from around the world are connecting through new formats shaped here in Bonn. This One World, One Health Global Landscapes Forum is a wonderful example and I commend the GLF for their pioneering work in this field. Another innovative format has been the three-week ECLE Bonn Daring Cities 2020 virtual forum on cities in the climate emergency concluding today. We live in difficult times. Although the COPs on climate, nature and land had to be postponed to 2021, the global debates are carried on through online consultations and hybrid formats. The first ever UN Biodiversity Summit on 30th of this September has brought together heads of states despite the pandemic an important step towards the new post-2020 biodiversity framework to be adopted in Kunming, China in 2021. An online consultation process steered by the Scottish Government and ECLE on behalf of the Global Task Force of Cities and Regions has resulted in the Edinburgh Declaration of Local and Regional Governments. Cities and regions stand ready to play a stronger role, far beyond implementation, with a stepped-up plan of action in the coming decade and they call for the installation of a multi-stakeholder platform. I trust in the global landscapes community to add its perspective to the debate towards Kunming, also in the light of mainstreaming health in our sustainability efforts at all levels. Please take my best wishes for the success of this One World, One Health Forum and for the future path of the Global Landscapes Forum. saddest word I know is the word endling. An endling is the name for the last individual of a species and at its death the species is extinct. This is a letter to an endling. Dear Essa, your name Essa means the only one in human language, the lonely one. After your last heartbeat, the world will be gone forever. Not, people think, an important one, only yours, but your only world. After your last flight, a freedom will be lost forever. 
not, people think, an important one, only yours, but your only freedom. After your last song, a category of music will be silenced forever. Not, people think, an important one, only yours, but your only song, and the only one you ever wanted to hear sung back to you. For while you live, you can sing your female laughing thrush call all you like, and no male will ever answer you, and you will never know why. Your story happened because of the slaughter of songbirds in flocks once, then trapped, traded and caged, sentenced to solitary, forced to sing solo, bird sorrow for a status symbol. You're a nervous bird. In the photograph I have of you, you look frightened. Your eyes are an orange circle with a black center and you don't like being in the eye line of your keepers. You're easily stressed, would rather be hidden in deep foliage tucked in the thickets of forests. You've never wanted to call attention to yourself except for a mate, but now you have the cachet of true tragedy, your kind, the rufous fronted laughing thrush subspecies Slamatensis is named as the world's next most likely known extinction. You, exactly you, Essa, one single individual bird, are the last. Your death will mark its extinction. You, Essa, the lonely one, as the last individual of your kind, are an endling. This is what extinction sounds like, the silencing of song that should have been forever yours. Forever yours, Jay. Jay for that truly powerful and evocative poem. And thank you all for joining us today for the opening plenary of the Global Landscapes Forum, latest digital conference on biodiversity enabling one world, one health. I am delighted to be your co-host for this opening plenary and it's our pleasure to be joined by our second co-host, Tony Simons, the Executive Director of the C4 and ECRAF and Resilient Landscapes. Great, so it's a pleasure to join you here in co-hosting this event. And um, we are aiming to have an intergenerational dialogue um, between ourselves. And uh, Camille, did you want to set us off? Yeah, Tony, I'm quite sad about the poem, really. It's it's such a powerful poem. And it the last part of it is, is really um, heartbreaking and it says this is what extinction sounds like the silencing of song that should have been forever yours and it's not just a loss of generation but a loss forever for all generations and whether it's baby boomers generation x 
or millennials or generation Greta. And now, like, given your cheeky and sometimes irreverent character, some of our audience may think that, you know, we are both millennials. But I hope you don't mind me pointing out our slight age gap. And, you know, when you were in my current age, there were no mobile phones and there was no um, digital conferences. So, and even the human population was 3 billion less than it is today. And even the carbon dioxide concentrations were only, what, 340 parts per mil. However, can you share to us, to the audience, what did biodiversity mean to you back then? Well, um, thanks, Camille. That's um, a very thought-provoking question. So what did biodiversity mean to uh, a youth growing up in New Zealand in 1983? And let me try and address that at three levels of the habitat, the species, and the genetic level. Well, surely at the habitat level, it was about save the rainforests. And here we had icons of green tree frogs, toucan, jaguars, and sloths. And most young people got on board with the slogan, albeit with not very much knowledge about whether we were trying to save the rain, save the forest or save the rain or, or save both, if you like. At the species level, it was definitely about save the whale. And the Greenpeace boat, the Rainbow Warrior, kind of brought together the uh, environmental movement, the conservation movement and the peace movement because they were both anti-whaling and anti-nuclear testing. And at the gene level, we were just starting to reap the benefits of research done 30 years earlier by Watson and Crick and Rosalind Franklin. And Fred Sanger uh, won his second Nobel Prize for chemistry for discovering the importance of the DNA nucleotide sequences. Um, that, that very same technology that we use today for testing COVID patients with uh, PCR testing. Camille, now let me turn the same question back to you. Imagine it's the year 2050, okay? And we've invited everyone to the Global Landscape Forum hologram conference in the year 2050. And there's a, a, a sparky young Congolese youth who asks you, so Camille, what did biodiversity mean to you back in the year 2020? I hope, Tony, that by then I have, you know, more wise seers and more to say for this Congolese uh, youth. But, you know, like, I will, I will tell them that biodiversity or what is happening in 2020, it, it's a difficult for all people. It's a very challenging year for all people, as you know. And, uh, and biodiversity was, was declining and many threatened species happening in our eyes. Yes, Tony. Good. Um, but more importantly, it's about what the audience and what fellow humans in our one world think about biodiversity. And that's over to you all. Why are you here today? And what generation, what ethnic group, what habitat, what perspective do you bring each to this conference? Yes, we want to ask you a question on Slido. So all the participants, please visit slido.com and use the code hashtag GLF biodiversity to tell us by answering the question, what would you like to see coming out of this conference? Again, I'll repeat, the website is slido.com, that is S-L-I-D-O dot C-O-M, and the code is hashtag GLF biodiversity. And please answer the question, what would you like to see coming out of this conference? Now, we will reflect on the Slido in just a few moments. It is time to introduce our opening speaker, the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity and National of the Republic of Tanzania. She's the seventh Executive Secretary to head the United Nations Biodiversity Convention. Ms. Mrema has worked with United Nations Environmental Program for over two decades as director of the Law Division, 
Deputy and Acting Director of the Ecosystems Division and Acting Director of the Corporate Services Division. In 2009, she was appointed as the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Environmental Program, the Secretary of the Convention on the Conservation of Migratory Species of Wild Animals. She is also the Acting Executive Secretary of the Ascobans and Interim Executive Secretary of the Gorilla Agreement, all based in Bonn, Germany, and held that position until 2012. In 2007, she received the first ever United Nations Environmental Program Baobab Staff Award. Let me all welcome you, Mrs. Elizabeth Maruma Rema. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Camilla, for that kind uh, introduction. But let me start first by thanking the organizers of this important forum and indeed discussing these important issues. Uh, all courtesies observed, I'm honored to be speaking amongst those of you who have joined this forum to listen and discuss and engage in the search for ways to reverse the trends of environmental loss and degradation. And the poem could not speak better than the situation we are facing today. I want to tell you about an interview I read with a 13 year old environmental advocate who questioned, why go to school if we won't have the future? Why go to school if we are going to be too busy running from the next hurricane or fire? When youth, those who hold the future in their hands, raise these poignant questions, ladies and gentlemen, there's something broken that we all need to fix and fix urgently. Allow me to offer few thoughts in this regard. We are living through one of the most extraordinary threats to global health, compounded by interlocking crises of biodiversity loss, land and environmental degradation and climate change. Biodiversity is declining at an unprecedented rate with human actions threatening species with global extinction more than ever before. 75% of the land surface is significantly altered. In 2018 alone, the worldwide economic stress and damage from natural disasters totaled over US dollars 160 billion. Climate change will also lead to increased health crisis, burdening thinly stretched healthy systems, particularly for the poorest and most vulnerable, including many low and middle income countries. We are nearing dangerous biospheric tipping points. If that if crossed, will lead to abrupt irreversible change. Biodiversity loss limits the discovery of potential treatments of many diseases and healthy problems. Nature and diversity of microorganisms, flora and fauna is our source of medicines and antibiotics. Biodiversity loss therefore erases a multitude of biomedical discoveries for our own future. Let me be clear here. Nature is not to be blamed for COVID-19 pandemic. Our unsustainable interactions with nature have created the conditions for this situation, which is to be blamed. We are aware that 60% of known infectious diseases and 75% of emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic in nature. But the mismanagement of wildlife and their habitats contributes to the risk of emerging infectious diseases outbreaks. Dear participants, even though this is our current sobering reality, we must not and are not faltering. We will not rest until all of us at all levels all of government, all of society 
are mobilized to realize the 2050 vision agreed by the world leaders of living in harmony with nature. How we treat nature has contributed to our environmental crisis. However, nature is also an important part of the solution. Conserving and restoring ecosystems can prevent further degradation and will abate the conditions for the emergence of other zoonotic diseases. And we must begin this right away. As we stop degradation and begin to restore the ecosystems of the world, we will advance the climate and land agenda while generating the needed employment. On one health approach, which recognizes the intrinsic connection between human health, animal health, and health and resilience of nature, will not only promote sustainable health and just recovery from COVID-19 pandemic, but it will also serve broader health objectives beyond the absence of diseases. It will equally strengthen the resilience of social, ecological, and ecosystems, economic ecosystems. Post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework currently under negotiation will pave the way for 10 years of action to bend the curve of biodiversity loss. With the voices and actions of youth, indigenous peoples and local communities, women, farmers, smallholders, private sector, and all stakeholders, a new framework will set in a path of recovery. Over the next two days, the Global Landscape uh, Forum is kindly providing us with this open space for discussion. And many of our convention uh, uh, governmental focal points are also here with us learning and contributing. So let us take advantage of this space and have frank discussions about our collective future we want. Allow me to conclude by responding to the anxiety of that 13 year old child and sending a message, not only to her, but to all youth and children and all of you, all of us. We face daunting challenges, but the will to push boundaries and, de and demand nothing else, nothing less than a healthy planet for people and pro uh, prosperity prevails. We are at crossroads and it is, in, it is within all of us to take actions for, the, for a world in which every person has dignity, prosperity, and can live in harmony with nature. Let me let the conversation then begins. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much indeed, Elizabeth. And it's my pleasure now to introduce our next principal speaker, who is Shahid Naim. And Shahid is the E3B professor and chair of the Department of Ecology, Evolution and Environmental Biology at Columbia University. So Shahid, to kick us off on, on some of the question-based aspects, how did we get here? <clears throat> well, well, thank you, Tony. What a pleasure to be here. I, I'd like to, ec to echo the Executive Secretary's uh, uh, gratitude for the organizers for this uh, conference. Um, it's amazing to and complicated to organize such a such a difficult thing. But if I had one um, uh, a criticism, would be that you invited me, a professor of ecology, to uh, answer the question of um, of uh, how we got here, and um, and you'll see uh, <laughs> that I have a an approach which might seem unorthodox, but I hope will drive home an important point that will complement many of the points that are being raised at this conference. And um, I believe the slides are, are, are uh, controlled by uh, your group there. All right, so how did we get here? Well, if you ask a professor of ecology, um, we say, let's start at the beginning. And the beginning was 14 uh, a billion years ago. And that 
um, seems like a very, very long time because we have no scale. And for many of us, most people I think of, they think of it as infinite. They think of it as a very, very long um, period of time. How can we imagine what um, uh, 14 billion years is like from the beginning, you know, when we had the, the, the Big Bang and the expansion to the formation of stars and galaxies. But it's the starting point because that's where all of the elements, the 90 or so elements that are important in our universe were created. The carbon, the hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus that makes up life, that makes up our atmosphere, that determines the fertility of our soil and the potability of our water. That's where it all started. And for reference to get a handle on what this, um, um, uh, time frame is, if we could have the next slide, you can see that this, which looks like a landscape painting from a sinner in hell, um, is actually our Eden. This is the Garden of Eden. This is Earth 3.5 to 4.5 billion years ago. And this is the cradle of life. And while it might seem like an inhospitable place with the moon still glowing from its collision with, uh, with, with Earth, but with an atmosphere that consists of methane, cyanide, and toxic uh, compounds, lots of radiation bathing the earth, was actually the perfect place for the first bacterium, the first archaeal cell to be formed. This is actually a true vision of what the Garden of Eden looks like. But down here, where it says 3.5 to 4.5 billion years, that is the frame of reference. Because if you think about it, out of 14 billion years, it means that one third of all of the time that there has been in our universe, and this is our universe, it's the only amount of time we have. There is no other amount. It's not an infinite amount of time. One third of that time was taken to produce the earth that we know today. You, me, our children, the animals and micro microorganisms and plants that we see, it took one third of all of the time that there is in the universe. And if you think about that poem that we started out with, a powerful poem, what it's talking about is the loss of something that took a third of the, all the time in the universe to create. And if we go to the next slide, I feel that you know it's important to sort of address the question about what is biodiversity. And this is often how we do it. I like showing these, these pictures because these are slides of images of, um, that I have taken as I've done my research with my students and colleagues all around the world. I haven't been to Antarctica, but just about every place else. And, and I think when you see this, the first thing you think about is the cultural biodiversity, their value to us as, in terms of their, their aesthetics, their, their dynamics, their beauty, what they mean to us as sources of medicines, as the executive secretary had told us, and as sources of, um, of recreation, inspiration, and, and art. But if we go back to the beginning as to how we got here, I look at them, and this is where it's the danger of being a professor of ecology, as vessels of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur and phosphorus. And it is this that actually makes them incredibly valuable, incredibly powerful, and incredibly unique. And when I look out into the audience and think of the 4,000 people that are um, participating here and the millions who are on social networking listening to this conference, even now, as I speak, as you uh, listen, we are contributing to the biogeochemistry of the world. So in the next slide, a while back, we were asked by science to write a review paper about the relationship between biodiversity, ecosystem functions, and ecosystem services. And this is the diagram that we came up with. And it shows you know, the, the 3.7 to 4 billion years of evolutionary history that generated 8.7 million species, which now total about a trillion tons of carbon. And what it really tries to show is that life on Earth is basically the biogeochemical engine. It is the chemistry that actually makes our climate equitable, our air breathable, our water potable, and our soil fertile. And that might be hard when we think about biodiversity that consists of bats and snow leopards and, and, and orangutans and, and, and beautiful orchids to think of them as biogeochemical vessels, but it's important to do so. And what this diagram also shows is as you move to the right in each one of these images, every one of these species, including ourselves, our ecosystem service providers. But our own contribution has actually been very heavily biased towards serving our own needs. Now that's not bad because every species does that. It's just we've excelled at it. And now we're taking the time at this turning point to consider how we might do this by engaging the other 7.5 million species. So in the next slide, in my last slide, um, I think this is an excellent um, example of, of where we're at. 
This is the Swiss Re Biodiversity, <clears throat> Biodiversity Ecosystem Service Index. And what's nice about this is it's private industry, it's private companies, it's the business sector contributing to the environmental arena. And it's so important that we engage them as partners. And what this diagram shows is that all of the ecosystem services that we rely upon, the things that make our world stable, resilient, and an equitable place to live is actually, <clears throat> dependent on the biodiversity that is <clears throat> underpinning all of those functions. And it shows in the red where these ecosystem services are at risk because biodiversity is at risk. It actually aggregates about 10 critical ecosystem services, such as production uh, of, um, uh, of timber, of food, and of uh, uh, potable water. And then it actually says, what is the risk that each of these things are facing. And there are two things about this. One is it provides us with a sense on a kilometer square basis where places are important for conservation and where places are important for harmonizing, as Executive Secretary said, with nature. So thank you very much for allowing a professor of ecology to share his somewhat unorthodox view of what biodiversity and ecosystems mean. Great, thanks very much, Shahid. And I pass it over to Camille. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, thank you, Shahid, for that very eye-opening uh, message. Now, we will go to our next principal speaker who will address the question, what should we change? Now, she's a physician and a research scholar with the program on science and global security at the Princeton University School of Public and International Affairs. Let me welcome you, Dr. Laura Kahn. Thank you so much, Camille. It's a pleasure for me to be here and I'm very grateful to the organizers for um, putting on such an important meeting. So I'm a part of the One Health Initiative. One Health is very simply the concept that human, animal, environmental and ecosystem health are linked. And this framework, this concept then provides a very useful framework for examining complex issues such as biodiversity and its relationship to food security and emerging zoonotic diseases. We must examine the root causes of these zoonotic spillover events if we are to develop effective policies to address them and ideally to prevent them. And I think it's very important to recognize that people interact with their environment every day by inhaling air, drinking water, and ingesting plants and animals, also known as food. Next slide, please. So the question we must ask is, what are we going to change? We have a growing population with diminishing natural resources and biodiversity. And yet the second of the UN Sustainable Development Goals is zero hunger. Now it's important to recognize that humans and their domesticated animals now constitute about 96 to 98% of the global terrestrial mammalian zoo mass. And all, all of them must eat. Next slide, please. Now many, this has been previously mentioned, but many of the microbes that are emerging are zoonotic. They are diseases of animals that infect humans. They are emerging either directly or indirectly from society's demand for meat and other proteins. So, but it goes both ways. Uh, the, uh, the animals can give us their microbes and we can give the animals our microbes too. It's a two-way stream. Next slide, please. So uh, the United Nations had declare, has declared that food is a human right, but it did not declare what kind of food. And the question we must ask as a global society is whether or not uh, animals, either domesticated or, what, or more particularly wild animals, is the consumption of wild animals a human right? Um, many of the diseases that are emerging into human populations are coming from wild animals. 
The second question we must ask is, should wildlife trade and live animal markets be banned in order to prevent further spillover events? Now to um, examine that question more closely, we can do a comparison between China and India, since both countries have live animal markets. So for example, both have over 1 billion people. Both have issues with sanitation and hygiene. Both are major users of antibiotics and both have severe problems with antimicrobial resistance. China, however, has a tradition of eating wild animals and using them in traditional Chinese medicines. In contrast, about 80% of Indians are Hindu and about 40% of them are vegetarian. Um, India, while it has many infectious disease problems, it is not having coronavirus spillover events such as China. India has the largest fraction of vegetarians of any country in the world. And that is largely because of its religion. Now there are pros and cons to eating meat. Meat provides important micronutrients such as vitamin B12 and iron. There's evidence that we evolved into modern humans because we hunted, cooked and ate meat. And meat in many countries is an integral part of religions and cultures. But it has many cons. Meat is not essential if uh, vegetarians or vegans supplement their diet with vitamin B12 and other vitamins and minerals. Raising domesticated animals and hunting wild animals contaminates the environment and reduces biodiversity and it increases zoonotic spillover risk. So these are important issues that we must contemplate. Now, of course, those, uh, there are some countries that eat much more meat than others. Here in the United States, we have the highest meat consumption per capita of any country in the world. And we are in no moral position to tell other countries what they can or cannot eat. But I think uh, it behooves us to examine this question of our relationship with other animals uh, and uh, our consumption of them as we um, move further along in our discussion of how to preserve the life on our planet. Next slide, please. So we must figure out how to sustainably feed ourselves and maintain our civilization on a hotter and drier planet. We need to integrate our efforts to benefit humans, animals, environments, and ecosystems. We cannot simply think about ourselves if we wanna preserve biodiversity, which ultimately will help preserve ourselves and our civilization. Food security and zoonotic disease prevention require an interdisciplinary holistic One Health approach. Next slide, please. And finally, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues with the One Health Initiative. We are co-founded in 2006. Our website, onehealthinitiative.com, was established in 2008. Uh, it's a labor of love for us. Please visit it and tell your uh, friends and colleagues to visit it as well. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Great. Thanks very much, Laura. That was an absolutely delightful um, response to the question, what should we change? Which brings us to our last principal speaker, who is Yolanda Cacabatza, who is the former Minister of Environment for Ecuador. And we pose to you, Yolanda, when the screen technology catches up with us. I am. I am Great. online. Fantastic. So, Yolanda, with all of that from uh, Shahid and Laura, where do we start? <laughs> uh, that's that is a, a fascinating question because we can start with many actions. And I see that the main problem at this moment, Tony, is that we need to involve all members of society. 
uh, I, I find that, for example, we need to change the language. We are using very sophisticated language. I find, I think I'm well educated and understand most of it, but I, I can't get the language of the experts when they try to explain what's going on in the planet and what needs to happen. The first change I would make is that we shouldn't call it climate change, but climate crisis. Biodiversity depletion, but biodiversity crisis. Those are the words that people need to hear in order to understand and act. So first change, move from technicities into common understandable language that everybody can, can, uh, can sort of uh, understand and act and be called on. The second, um, the second thing is uh, define topics that are close to the everyday life for society to react to. I find, for example, that food loss and waste is one of those topics because it touches everybody. We all eat and we all get food from somewhere. And we all should know that about a third of the food that we produce in the planet is wasted. We all should know that 800 million people go to sleep at night with no food. And we should also know that if food loss and waste was a country, it would be the third emitter of gases, China, US, and food loss and waste. The moment you digest this information, you are immediately concerned. You are immediately willing to act and do something about that. And I find that the young, Elizabeth uh, touched on that and Shahid also, young people uh, can and do act and begin to change things when they learn um, these facts. And, and it touches also every sector of society, the producer and the consumer, young and all, men and women, north, south, east and west. And also we should discuss what the impact of these potential changes can be. In the case of food loss and waste, it's a, an economic uh, impact. Every dollar that is spent on reducing food loss and waste gives a return of $7. That's a lot. And we should, we should move that agenda forward. It has a social impact because it begins to link sectors of society that in a way have become clusters and don't want to connect. Even worse now that we are living through this COVID-19 crisis. It helps biodiversity because it makes us think of how do we deal with agriculture. And if I had to put my finger onto the most important issue we need to address at this moment, where do we start? Is changing patterns of food production, of agriculture. That will help biodiversity. The restoration of soil and land will, will help climate, will help society, and will help definitely our economy. I just want to end, Tony, by, by quoting a, a great man, Monsignor Desmond Tutu from South Africa. He was asked one day whether he is a pessimist or an optimist. And he responded, I'm not a pessimist, I'm not an optimist, I'm a prisoner of hope. And I think all of us should be prisoners of hope and give positive messages, not about gloom and doom, but of what can we do to make this planet better for all of us. Wow, Yolanda, um, quoting colleagues, but also listening to the wisdom from yourself, it's, it's it's fascinating. Thank you very much for that. Great. So we've been treated today to a fantastic expose of, on biodiversity from our principal speakers. We heard about how we got in this dire situation. We heard about what needs to change. And we heard about where we should focus. And three key principles seem to emerge from our principal speakers, namely 
do no harm to biodiversity, better value biodiversity, and strengthen the positive connections between humans and nature. So let's just check quickly on the Slido responses to see if we have some uncorroborated responses to our first Slido question. What do you want to see come out of this conference? Okay, so using a word cloud basis, global collective action. Let's all do something together. Action, perhaps reflecting too much words, too many pledges, the need to have concrete goals and targets. Indigenous peoples being heard, that's a very powerful message obviously coming across there and, and, and that's wonderful. We're pressed for time. We don't want to uh, um, disappoint the next panel that's coming up, but um, how, what, where? And of course the big missing dimension is who? And we all like to set global goals and national targets but well, what can each of us commit to? So Camille, in 20 words or less, after listening to our principal speakers, what are two things that you feel you can personally commit to in strengthening biodiversity? Thank you, Tony. I think the foremost for me to really commit is really to reassess our values as young people and to really know our connection with nature. I think knowledge is really powerful. If we need to share what we know, whatever is coming up in this conference, we need to share this out with other people who is not also very biodiversity aware. And I think we also need to seek sustainable products as what uh, Yolanda was saying, um, and, and with the food production that is happening right now. So I think we have over 4,000 participants online today, Tony, it's amazing. And most of them are actually biodiversity um, aware, but you know, sometimes biodiversity comes across as a bit fuzzy and a bit disconnected to daily people. So why are there no 4 million people? Why is it only 4,000? <laughs> wow, let, let's hope for 4 million next time. But I, I guess the best single word answer to that question is time. And that's not just the time to log on to, to join the conference, but how generations feel about the time that is available for change. Biodiversity, like climate change considerations, are seen as taking decades, centuries, millennia. And young people want instant results. And older people have very little time left to make a difference. But whether you're young or old, we can all make a difference. And we can all make that difference quickly with biodiversity. As Yolanda said, we can stop food waste. We can stop using dangerous pesticides. We can demand and consume a variety of foods. We can get involved in citizen science projects. Surely we can make sure our own organizations work and our literature is not biodiversity blind in the same way that we wouldn't want them to be gender blind. Restoring ecosystems can be started immediately and can show quick results. Don't let time be an excuse. And now that's a great segue into our next plenary hosted session by UNEP on the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Thanks very much to you, Camille. Thanks to our speakers and everybody wishing you a successful GLF Conference on Biodiversity, Enabling One Health, One World, One Health.